הייתי מאוד רוצה לדעת אם כבוד הרב עדיין מחזיק בדעה שצריך את כל השטחים להשאיר חרף כל המסיבות את יהודה, את שומרון ואת עזה יש לך השפעה בעניין מיניהם? יש לי השפעה כמו לכל יהודי ואני אשתדל להפעיל אותה אבל הייתי רוצה לדעת אם כבוד הרב מחזיק בדעה אם אני יכול להשפיע עליך אז זה השפעתי צריך לי בכיוון שכל ארץ ישראל שייכת בארץ ישראל וכל הנס וחלק ממנו ומישהו אחר הוא גזל לשר ישראל אפילו אם זה כולל מלחמה נגד כל העולם? מה? אפילו אם זה יכול לכלול מלחמה נגד כל העולם? זה לא יכול לכלול מלחמה אלא הרצון ללחם בישראל הם זקוקים לסיבה מיוחדת כי הם רצון להזיק לישראל אם כל מקטינים מביאים לישראל ויגידו כך, הם יגידו כך. אני בא מרוסיה. ברוסיה היה את כל מזלמי לסדם, עולה בשביל שהיהודים לא יאשמים בזה, בשביל שהתקוים חיפשו משהו להעליל ולהזיק לישראל. ולא יכול להיות שהגויים יעשו איתנו שלום אי פעם? מה? לא יכול להיות שהגויים יעשו איתנו שלום, ירצו לעשות שלום? אז אם מסכימים למה שאת רוצה, למה שאני אעשה, אם יש להם כיח, איזה טוב ליבי ויבוך וימנה מהם. זה טוב לי בקודש ברוך הוא. בקודש ברוך הוא אין זוכר לידות שלי, כי כל אחד מישראל, בכל מקום שוב, הלך אז כמה וכמה. בארץ ישראל הרי זה בנו יחיד של הקודש ברוך הוא. אותך פשוט ימים שאולי להזיר משהו מארץ ישראל. אין כדאי לרבות זמן. לך פשוט ימים אולי להחזיר משהו מארץ ישראל. תודה רבה כבודה. we begin to internalize the criticism of us. We all must be terrible people. So Achad Am, who is an early Zionist, he says, you know, the blood libel, which anyone who grew up among Jews knows that they never heard of anybody uh, putting blood in their matzah. We grow, we, we know this, it's not on the menu. So we know that these lies which people across the board believe, she says, Is it possible that everyone can be wrong and the Jews right? Yes. The blood accusation proves it's possible. And when you see the nonsense and the, and the manipulation of concepts and words and to make the Jews guilty of every sin in the book, you see it's okay. The world can be wrong and I can be right. Can you have confidence in that? The reality is um, the Jewish people have always been a minority. And if we follow the majority as far as changing our minds, we all would become Christians and Muslims a long time ago. And we didn't because we stood up for what we knew to be true. So number one, first and foremost, as we dive into this, it's important that we are able to feel confident in ourselves and don't be so intimidated because of all the talking heads or uh, whoever else they may be. It's okay. Okay. It's okay, Abraham was one Jew against the whole world. Each one of us is an Abraham. Okay, so the issue about anti-Semitism is, is that we've had different theories about anti-Semitism. And when we dig deeper in each one of these, what we discover is that um, they're full of contradictions. Whatever claim, you're a rootless cosmopolitan, you are a nationalist. You are a capitalist, you're a communist. In other words, it didn't matter what was said. So, you know, people say, oh, the Jews have money. You know what? Poor Jews are massacred all the time as well. Sometimes more than rich Jews, the chosen people. Every nation almost has a vision of themselves being chosen. It doesn't make everyone have anti-Semitism for them or anti-Chinese or whatever it is. In addition, when Jews stopped acting chosen and tried to be like everyone else, It increased the anti-Semitism. It didn't get rid of it. Jews went through the streets screaming, I'm not chosen, I'm not chosen. I want to be part of Berlin. I want to be a German. I want to be a Frenchman. You're the chosen people. I want to get rid of my identity. It didn't get rid of anti-Semitism. Religion or race, also not. 
You see clearly it worked both ways. So the problem of any historical explanation of anti-Semitism, they all come up short. So Jonathan Sachs has a take on it. He says, I'll just paraphrase, but it's in the text. Number three, today's anti-Semitism is a new phenomenon, continuous with, yet significantly different from the past. To fathom the transformation, you must define what anti-Semitism is. In the past, it's in the text as well, so you can see it easier. In the past, Jews were hated because they were rich and because they were poor. They were capitalists and because they were communists. Because they kept themselves, because they infiltrated everywhere. Because they have tenaciously these superstitious faith, like Voltaire. And because they were rootless cosmopolitans who believed in nothing. All these things existed. Because anti-Semitism is not an ideology. It's not a coherent set of beliefs. It's, in fact, an endless stream of contradictions. The best way of understanding it is to see it as a virus. Viruses attack the human body, but the body itself has an immensely sophisticated defense, the human immune system. But then do viruses survive? How then do viruses survive and flourish? By mutating. Anti-Semitism mutates, and in so doing, defeats the immune system set up by cultures to protect themselves against hatred. There have been three such mutations in the past 2,000 years, and we're living through the fourth. The first took place with the birth of Christianity. In other words, before then, there have been many Hellenistic writers who were hostile to Jews. They were also dismissive of other non-Hellenistic people. The Greeks called them barbarians. There was nothing personal in their attack on Jews. Not necessarily, but this is Jonathan Sachs. This was not anti-Semitism. It was xenophobia. We could debate this in a little bit. We'll come back to it. But historically, what you do find is a unique role that happens post-Christianity. This change in Christianity, as it later to happen with Islam, the founder of the new faith, largely based on Judaism itself, believed that Jews would join the new dispensation and were scandalized when they did not. Jews were held guilty of not recognizing, worse still, being complicit in the death of the Messiah or of God. A strain of Judophobia entered the Christianity in some of its early texts and became a fully fledged genre that versus Judaic literature in the days of the church fathers. In other words, you killed our God, or the blood of him will be upon you and upon your children or on your art, whatever the language used there, or the idea that you're the spawn of the devil because you can't be of God. All these things exist in the New Testament and ended up being part of certain strands in Christianity, some more than others. From here on, Jews, not general Christians in general, became the target of what Jews eyes would call the teachings of contempt. That existed with Christianity. And then Islam in its own way as well, to a lesser degree than Christianity, because for the for the Muslim, you have to be degraded, you have to be a dhimmi. But for the Christian, there was an element where you're the witness to the evil that you did, and that the only way they get their fulfillment of their religion is when you convert to theirs, or you suffer as a witness to what you did bad. So the second mutation begins, oh, here it is a little bit more, in 1096, when the Crusaders on the way to conquer Jerusalem stopped to massacre Jewish communities in Vermazia and Worms, fire and mines, the first major European program in Norwich, it was the first blood libel. Religious Judy became demonic. Jews were no longer just the people who reject Christianity. They began to be seen as malevolent force, killing children, desecrating the host, poisoning wells, spreading the plague. So that was the next mutation. It became a persecuting society. Your third mutation is when the word anti-Semitism comes up. It emerged in an age of enlightenment, the secular national state, liberalism and emancipation. How do you make room for anti-Semitism in liberalism and emancipation? Religious prejudice was deemed to be a thing of the past. The new hatred had to therefore to justify itself on different grounds, race. This is a faithful development because you can change your religion, you cannot change your race. Christians are work for the conversion of the Jews. Racists can only work for the extermination of the Jews. So the Holocaust was born. Okay, maybe a bit of a, you know, a few movements, but that's basically the 60 years after the word came the deed. Today, we're living through the fourth mutation. Unlike its predecessors, the new anti-Semitism does not focus not on Judaism as a religion, nor on Judaism as a race, but on Jews as a nation. It consists of three propositions. First, alone of the 192 nations make up the United Nations, Jews are not entitled to a state of their own. As Amos Uz noted, in the 30s, anti-Semites said Jews to Palestine. Today, they shoot Jews out of Palestine. He said they don't want us to be there. They don't want us to be here. They don't want us to be. The second is that Jews, the state of Israel, the terms are often used to change, are responsible for the evils of the world, from AIDS to global warming. All the old anti-Semitic myths have been recycled from the blood libel of the parochial levels of Zion, still a bestseller in many parts of the world. The third is that all Jews are Zionists, and they are full legitimate tar objects of attack. You could bomb, they bomb in synagogue in Jerba and Istanbul. 
and young yeshiva students, and this is all written a few years ago. So it's much worse today. The new anti-Semitic attack on Jews as a nation seeking to exist as a nation, like every other nation on the face of the earth, with rights of self-determination. How did this happen? How did it penetrate the most sophisticated immune system ever constructed? The entire panoply of international measures designed to ensure that nothing like the Holocaust would ever happen again. From the United Nations Universal Declaration of Human Rights to the Stockholm Declaration of 2000. The answer lies in the mode of self-justification. Anti-Semitic, most people at most times feel a residual guilt in hating the innocent. So therefore, anti-Semitism always has to find legitimation in the most prestigious source of authority any given time. In the first century of the Common Era, and again in the Middle Ages, it was religion. That's why Judophobia took the form of religious doctrine. In the 19th century, religion lost prestige. The supreme authority was now science. Racial antisemitism was duly based on two pseudosciences. Social Darwinism, the idea that in society, as a nature, the strong survived by eliminating the weak, and the so-called scientific study of race. By the late 20th century, science had lost its prestige, having given us the power to destroy life on Earth. Today, the supreme source of legitimacy is human rights. That's why Jews, or the Jewish state, are accused of the five primal sins against human rights. Racism, apartheid, ethnic cleansing, attempted genocide, and now it's genocide, and crimes against humanity. This is where we have come, because how do we, what is the God of the time? What the greatest evil of the time is if you are not uh, on board with human rights? So therefore, that's what they've weaponized, because anti-Semitism is, by definition, uh, a, a cause waiting for a uh, philosophy. It doesn't matter what the philosophy is. If it's the, as long as we can blame the Jews, that's all. Blame the Jews. This is what it is. Now, is this, is this inevitable? Is this our destiny? Is this something I did wrong? Tell me what it is. Tell me what it was. What is it about? Is it a spiritual destiny? Is there a, are there ways to combat it? Are there ways to make it worse? What, 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 how does Judaism view this? In our Haggadah, reading number four. This is what's to our fathers and for us. But not just one alone has risen up against us, but every generation they get up and they try to destroy us. And the Holy One, blessed be, saves us from their hand. It's part of the warp and woof of our existence. We have not yet given a reason. We're saying every generation is somebody. But God saves us. Sometimes he preempts and he gets in early. Sometimes he gets in late. It's a problem. We survive as a people. As individuals, we've had suffering. You could look at our history. You want to be careful not to have the lacrimose, the depressed view of history where it's just a string of persecutions. Because in the worst of times, when we look back in the Middle Ages, there were Jews very happy, enjoying and joyfully celebrating their life. And they wouldn't change their religion for the world, literally. Nevertheless, there have been persecutions in our history. We have had, in the United States, a quiet time for 50, 60 years. Right now, the ancient beasts are stirring. What that will lead to, we don't yet know. We see what it's leading to in Israel. It's an attempt to delegitimize the right for the Jews to protect themselves. We're supposed to roll over and die. This is what the, 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 they want us to do. You're protecting yourself, so it's genocide. What do you want us to do? We don't have an answer for you, they, the world says. But you can't do what you're doing. So what do you want us to do? That Checkmate, says Hamas. We can exactly continue doing what we're doing because you can't do anything to stop it because the world won't let you. We win, says Iran, says Hezbollah. We're, we, the world, is teaching the anti-Semites and the evildoers. Now, what we're going to say is, I wouldn't call them anti-Semites. Let's call them evildoers. This term, anti-Semites, is a term created by an anti-Semite. We call it vicious, wickedness. It's wickedness. Let's take a look at what we just learned in our Torah portion. Oh, oh, and the, and the Haggadah says, go forth and learn. Laban the Aramean wanted to do. Pharaoh only issued a decree against the boys, but Laban wanted to uproot them all. If you look at the biblical text, you don't find Laban explicitly trying to do that. But what he says is, Laban says to Jacob, your children are my children. You stay here with me. They will be raised by me. There's an attempt sometimes to erase Jewish peoplehood, even if it's not to kill us. Come, come, come over to our side. 
You just put up a sign. You be one of the good Jews. Say free Palestine, and you're one of the good Jews. Now you're okay. You don't say free Palestine. You're a bad Jew, and you were therefore part of the problem, and you're therefore part of the oppressors. Come on, my team. So um, nowadays it's a little more stark, but there have been times where the voices have said, assimilate, acculturate, leave your distinctiveness. And that was also a form of spiritual annihilation. We would have lost our identity and we would have disappeared into the greater population. If you look at this week's Torah portion, though, last week and this week, we're in Exodus. And where does the anti-Semitism come from there? So there it is a form of xenophobia. They're afraid that the Jews will multiply and push them out. So there's a fear, and the fear becomes hate. The Jews won't replace us, is what Pharaoh says. That's what they're afraid of. So there's a, a logic to it, so to speak, a fear, because they would have done that, and they did that. According to history, according to the, the Midrash, the Egyptians had pushed out the earlier inhabitants of their land. They were a new kingdom. If you look at the history, different kingdoms pushed out other kingdoms. And they said, if we did that to others, they're going to do that to us. So therefore, let's get the Jews first. A lot of times, what we're being accused of, just by the way, is what these people want to do. When they want to wipe you out, they say, oh, you want to commit genocide. Because they know exactly, if you listen, from 1948, the Arabs called all the Arabs living in Palestine at the time uh, to leave so they could wipe out the Jews and be able to come back. In 1967 and 1973, they said it from the radio and from the rooftops, we are going to wipe out all the Jews. And they weren't embarrassed. And this wasn't religious fanaticism. It was just good old secular nationalism with a little dose of Arab chauvinism. But it wasn't, it wasn't religious fanaticism. Eh, they may have quoted the Quran here and there, but they were all secularists, communists, many of them. Others were part of the... Uh, um, what was the name of the of the wow. uh, the Ba'ath Party, both in Iraq and in Syria and even in Egypt for a while? The Ba'ath Party, right? So you have these nationalists, secular nationalists. They quoted, they used the Quran when they wanted, but the point was eradication of the Jew is what they have not stopped saying. Now, some of them have. The fact is, right now, Saudi Arabia, who was the biggest promoter of anti-Semitism, supported Hamas. And before that, supported the uh, Fatah and supported the others. Al-Qaeda grew out of the Sunni radicalism. Right now, their world is Iran is a bigger threat. It doesn't mean that we became their best friend. If Israel's weak, they don't need Israel. If Israel's strong, do we need them? They're not exactly standing up for us right now. It's an interesting question. Would Israel be in a deeper doo-doo if they had already made a peace treaty with Saudi Arabia? And then with their hands have been tied about fear of losing this relationship that had just been crafted because the Saudi Arabian street has not yet come along where the leadership, the dictators and the kings are. In other words, the Arab world is full of dictators, full of uh, monarchies, full of um, uh, rule, not of the populace. And when you, the populace does rule, you get religious fanaticism right now because that has spread both the Shiite and the Sunni variety. So what you have is you have to deal with the dictators. The problem with dictators is their life expectancy at times is not always so good. They could, they could change in a minute, all of them, like we saw in the Arab Spring. So on one hand, we have to deal with these people, with the leadership, because you're not going to change the street too quickly. They have to change the street. On the other hand, you can't weaken yourself based on promises that they make to you, because it could change tomorrow. You don't know what Saudi Arabia is going to look like tomorrow. You'll be very careful about how, who are you putting sec your security in whose hands. Okay, so this was Exodus 5, where they're afraid. Let us deal shrewdly. Here's Maimonides. There's a time period in Yemen where the Jews are being um, attacked and trying to get them to forcibly convert. And Maimonides says, you are in a tough situation right now, but you should know we've been here before and we've survived it. It says that the divine assurance, reading six, that we would survive the people who degraded and discomfited us. As is written, and your seed should get dust of the earth. That is to say, just like people stamp on the dust, but ultimately everyone lies under the dust. Ultimately, we'll be victorious. So shall Israel outlive his persecutors. The prophet Isaiah long ago predicted that various people would succeed in vanquishing Israel and lording over them for some time. But ultimately, God will come to Israel's assistance and put a stop to their vows. 
We are in possession of divine assurance that Israel is indestructible and imperishable and will always continue to be a preeminent community. As it is impossible, says Maimonides, for God to cease to exist, so is Israel's destruction and disappearance from the world unthinkable. As God says, for I am the Lord, changeth not, and you, O sons of Jacob, will not be consumed. So, similarly, he has avowed and assured that he's unimaginable, that he will reject us entirely, even if we disobey him, as the Torah says. Indeed, I'm skipping a few lines, paraphrasing, this very promise we're given through Moses, that you'll be in the lands of your oppressors, and even though you'll send all this, they'll not reject you. So the Muslims who are telling these Jews in Yemen, your God has forsaken you, forgotten you. You know why? Because we have power. The, the, the proof of Islam that they were the chosen was they had power. So the problem with Islam is powerless, that is very destructive to their sense of self and their religion. In particular, if the Jew has power, that's an even greater problem for them. The existence of the Jew is not such a problem. The power of the Jew is a problem. For the early Christian, the existence of the Jew was a problem, or at least his non-degradation. It was an element where um, you, you, you rejected Jesus, you killed God, so therefore you are either going to be uh, assigned to the nations and what happens when you do that, or... Um, ultimately, you have to convert to Christianity. So it's a little bit different, but they both exist. So he says, put your trust in the true promises of the Torah and be not in dismay. The trials are designed to test and purify us so that the saints and pious ones will adhere to our religion and remain within the fold. Don't give up, he says. He strengthens them. One of the key lines and important things that we have to bear in mind is we say every Saturday night when we conclude Shabbos, here is the God of my salvation. I shall trust and not fear for the strength and praise eternal. The Lord was my salvation. Number one is we have to trust in God. Now, but keep your ammunition dry. In other words, there is an obligation that God says that as well as doing what, trusting in me that I run the world, there are things that you can do just like to earn a living, you don't sit back and lay in bed and say, God provides. It's true, God provides, but he wants a partner. It's true, we got manna from heaven. That was in the desert. Once we left the manna in heaven, you got to work for a living. If you want to get what you deserve and what you could accomplish in this world, God wants a partnership. And the same thing is with security. And the same thing is dealing with the nations that are around us. If you are a Jew in, in Russia today under Putin, if you're a Jew in Soviet Russia, you're a Jew in Tsarist Russia, you have to deal with authorities that do not necessarily follow uh, every jot and tittle of the American Bill of Rights. And therefore, you have to deal with, with, with people like that. You have to work within that game. You have to play within that system. You can't go, you know, working within the system at different times meant different things. Our challenge today is we've been spoiled because we live in America and we expect that the rules of justice should always prevail everywhere. I still have, I believe in America, but I'm just saying that we in America, we look outside, we look at The Hague, we look at the UN and we're shocked and we're, we're, we're mortified. The UN is made up of dictatorships and self-interest not built on the the in, uh, on, on the equality of man no matter what pious uh pro protesting and statements they're making there it's not they're a bunch of dictators you know the head of the human rights C uh, commission is iran mazel tov. and the next in line is sudan mazel tov. i mean come on it, 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 it's, it's not even a joke this is not 1984 this is the book this is not uh this is, this is absurd, but we somehow have these expectations. We expect there, you know, okay, the Hamas, um, um, uh, what do you call it again, Ministry of Health is now accepted as a source of authority for the New York Times, the Washington Post, and BBC over what the Israeli Defense Forces claim. Mazel tov. We're going to get upset. We're going to get shocked. We shouldn't be. We shouldn't be, number one. It doesn't mean we can't act to make changes, and we'll get to that in a, in a moment. Okay, here's one other element, a recognition that the battle against the Jews spiritually 
Here's a spiritual take. Your enemies will be scattered. So the Midrash says, who are God's enemies? God's enemies? He says, your enemies and let your haters flee before you. He says, are the haters before him who spoke and brought the world into being? The intent, rather, all who hate the righteous are haters of God. Similarly, as it says, in the greatness of your grandeur, you destroy those who rise against you. Anyone rises before the Lord? Those who rise up against the righteous are rising against the Lord. And similarly, forget not the voice of your adversaries, the everlasting roar of those who rise against you. Or for your foes are tumultuous, your haters have raised their heads. And you've been subtle in counting the people. Okay, here it goes. And look at Zechariah. He says, whoever touches you, touches the pupil of his eyes. To bomb the page. It's not really the pupil of the eye, but of his eye. God is using a euphemism for God that when you hurt the Jew, you're sticking your finger not in the Jew's eye, in God's eye. Now, it's not just enough for the Gentiles to know this by reading the Bible. The Jew has to know this. You are the representative of God on earth. It's true. The Christians kidnapped the Jew, kidnapped the Torah, and made it part of their religion. And they made that Jewish boy into God's representative on earth. But we see ourselves as being this suffering servant. We see ourselves as being God's representative on earth. That's where it started from. They happened to make it into one Jew and make him into a God. But for us, our religion consistently, all these verses are talking of the Jewish people. He says here, it's not written of the eye, but the people of his eye. That is your sticking of God, as it were. Okay, let me skip down. We'll skip down to um, Rabbi Shimon Ben Elazar said, midway through that page. There's nothing more beloved in a man's body than his eye. When a man is hit on the head, he closes his eyes. And the Jews are compared to his eye. He says here, whoever touches you, touches the pupil of his eye. Rabbi Yosef Ben Elazar says, the toucher is like when he sticks his finger and gouges it out. Look what I did to Pharaoh because of that. Look what I did to Sancherib, Nebuchadnezzar, to Haman. All these people. So here's the line here. And they midway, Shemot. And they saw the God of Israel. Let me see if I can highlight it so that, you know, I can't highlight that. And, uh, oh, I could. Would annotate. Here. Here we go. There you go. And they saw the God of Israel. And under his feet. The likeness of sapphire brick. And thus is written, all of afflictions he was afflicted. What does that tell us? It says that God suffers with us. And God says, I am with you in your affliction. Let me get rid of that now. Annotation, if I can get rid of it. Here's an easy way. Mm. All right. Let's see. I think I got rid of it there. Okay. So he says here, God says, with every one of us, I am with you in your suffering. If it was not written, it would be impossible to say such a thing. What are we saying? We are saying that, here it is. Um, if we're not explicitly written, it would be impossible to say it. Israel says before the Lord, you have redeemed yourself. That the verse says before, it's Samuel, before your people you redeemed from Egypt, a nation and its God. God says, I am in the burning bush with you. When you suffer, I am there. So to recognize that even an individual Jew, when God, when you are suffering, God is with you, so to speak. When someone attacks a Jew, he's attacking God. He says here, when they were exiled to Edom, the Shekhinah was with them, and they were turned, the Shekhinah will be with them. So this idea, which is extensively in many places, a recognition, number one is, God runs the world. Have faith. Number two, it's not about you, Jew. It's about God. You happen to be the representative on earth. They may not know this. They may not know this. Why is this? We'll talk about it a bit more spiritually. There are always reasons, like, like what Jonathan Sack, Robbie Sack said. There's all sorts of, it's a virus looking for a cause. I'm sorry, a cause looking for a philosophy is what I said. He said it's a, it's a, a virus mutating and taking different forms. All right, let's take a little bit further, reading number four. Um, the idea that we have to use logic and reason, but recognize everything comes from God is illuminated in the classic text of anti-Semitism, which is the Book of Esther. 
In the book of Esther, when Esther finds out that she has to go before the king and plead for his good graces, that he should fall in love with her again and save the Jews from annihilation, she says to Mordechai, I'm going to fast for three days and three nights. Now, that doesn't do wonders for your complexion or for your charms if you're falling on your face of starvation. But because she recognized that this was a spiritual battle and that it's true she had to go to the king, but she wanted to be with the Jewish people in their fasting. It's true, a warrior is not allowed to fast in Yom Kippur and Jishim. A warrior is not allowed to weaken himself in any way. You eat, you eat pork chops if that's what you have in, in, in war. It's, you have to save lives. But Esther sees herself as part of the people and she recognizes that when she goes before the king, this is a miracle. She's going to put on the form of nature. Just like when I go to work, I really know my money is mana from heaven. It happens to be I have a job. But that job is the vehicle through which God provides the mana. Now that's harder to see. The existence of the Jew, we've always seen miracles. Our very existence is miraculous. It makes no sense that the Jewish people are still here. No other nation has not uh, changed and morphed into something totally different um, by, by new invaders and things like that. The Jewish people have kept their identity. So the idea, though, we have to use, lo we have to use natural force, natural forces and natural um, elements, even though it's a spiritual entity. In other words, recognizing anti-Semitism exists. The why of it, I can't yet explain, but it does exist. And there is a spiritual component of it that is, so to speak, hardwired in. This doesn't mean they'll always have the power to hurt me or that I will not, that I will always lack the means to defend myself. Sometimes I'll be able to. And sometimes there are a lot of haters who have sticks and stones and they're far away and they can't hurt me. In other words, not always does a hater mean he'll be able to hurt you. And those who do, sometimes we find out about it in advance and can preempt it. And sometimes we don't know how God foils their plans. Okay. So here we have an interesting idea, though, that expresses this on a slightly different level. The natural state of the Jew is precarious because we are a minority, always in, surrounded by dominant cultures, majority cultures. And the euphemism is, I'll skip this line because it's not as relevant, but in, in the Midrash, Emperor Hadrian said to Rabbi Yeshua, great is the lamb, that's number 12, that survives among 70 wolves. He responded, great is the shepherd who saves the lamb and crushes them before it. This is what is written, a weapon formed against you will succeed. God is protecting, it's not the sheep. This is not a sheep armed to the teeth with a, with a oh, the sheep is surviving the wolves because he, he has a machine gun. No, 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 no. This is not it. It's rather the natural state of the sheep is not to survive among 70 wolves. That's the way it works. The famous joke, which I say all the time about the Bible zoo in Israel, that had a display of the wolf lying with the lamb. And when the zookeeper was asked, how do you do that? The wolf lies with the lamb. It's like messianic times. He says, new sheep every day. <laughs> so the natural state of all things is the sheep is going to be eaten. God, God protects us, which is why when the Jewish people, when we say, oh, sometimes the Jewish people sin and the nations attack, it's not necessarily always what we call a punishment. What it can be is the natural state of existence is that you are a sheep among 70 wolves. If, the she if you say to the shepherd, no, nah, I'm okay, God, I got it from here. I'm going to join the family of nations. I'm going to be under their protection. The UN is going to protect me. Hague is going to protect me. Grandpa Biden's going to protect me. Not necessarily. Grandpa Trump, also not necessarily. Not necessarily Uncle Sam either going to protect you. Thank God right now they have been. Thank God, we say. And we thank them too. But don't assume that the natural state of things is this small minority necessarily naturally survives. Our survival has been miraculous. And even in the land of Israel, miracles after miracles, not just the miracles of establishment of the state, the miracles of survival, the miracles even in this case, as horrific as it was, the miracles that Hezbollah didn't come down 
who were much more armed to do this sort of attack than Hamas was. They also have tunnels. They have many, many tens of thousands of much more um, 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 sophisticated rockets. And they've been training for this. The Hamas stole Hezbollah's plan. With God's help, the, 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 this temporary alliance between Sunni and Shiite will fall apart soon. When the Sunni see how the Shiites left them out to dry, with God's help, Hamas will turn just as in Syria. Hamas was fighting Hezbollah. They were fighting each other. But if you look what's happening now in Lebanon, the Palestinians who are there are cheering, and in Syria, are cheering when the Hezbollah guy gets taken out. Why? Because he was dropping barrel bombs on them all over Syria, massacring tens of thousands of men, women, and children. Who was? Hezbollah, working with Iran and Russia to crush the Islamic re re uh, revolt that was taking place in uh, I, uh, in, in Syria, and not just Islamic, popular revolt, and not just that, Sunni revolt. So all this, I mean to say, there's a lot of stuff going on with God's help. Uh, things can, can shift away from Israel with God's help. But till then, Israel has to do what it has to do to protect itself. You want a well-armed sheep, if, God is, if the shepherd is giving you the weapons, you want to make sure you have the ability to protect yourself. But you don't want to rely on them any more than you rely on your job and your health without God's help. How are you feeling? Baruch Hashem, I'm feeling fine. So in Eretz Yisrael today, the the, uh, the 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 line that they use is, "Am Am Yisrael Yinat Seach," the Jewish people be victorious. And many stations use the Ezra Hashem, "Am Yisrael Yinat Seach," with the help of God, will be successful and victorious. We recognize that this doesn't happen in a vacuum. There are many things, God forbid, that can go wrong and hurt, and harm, and destroy. It is not like we're, it's a walk in the park living in this neighborhood where the Jewish people live, where they decided to make, where God decided to give us the land. Okay, let's go a little bit further here. Um, I'm assuming that the videos are not going to work, so I'm not going to bother with the videos. I'll send links to everyone with God's help. So here's an interesting take on the earliest anti-Semitism that we find of killing Jews seemingly just because they're Jews. The story of Purim. The Purim story is Haman approaches Ahasuerus and he says, I'll give you 10,000 talents of silver. Let me kill the Jews. And Ahasuerus, the king says, hey, 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 you don't got to pay me. They're yours. Keep your change. A lot of money. 10,000 talents of silver, hundreds of millions of dollars in today's <laughs> cash. But he says, keep it. Kill the, kill, take the Jews. So the Talmud, has a midrash that says like this. To what can this be compared? Haman and Ahasuerus can compare with the parable. Two individuals. One has a mound in the middle of the earth, and the other has a ditch in the middle of his field. One has a mound, a big pile of extra dirt in his backyard. The other one has a hole. The owner of the ditch, noticing the mound of dirt, says, who will give me this mound? I'll pay it. And the other guy sees his ditch, says, you don't have to give me. Please take it. Please take my mound. The owner of the ditch said to the, oh, oh, oh they were, I'm sorry, they're the first saying to each other, I need a ditch. I need someone to dump it. I need a dumping ground for my mound. And the other guy says, I need a mound of dirt for my ditch. And they meet each other. And the owner of the ditch says to the owner of the mound, sell me your mound so I can fill in my ditch. The mound's owner says, take it, please. Ahasuerus wanted to get rid of the Jews. When Haman came along to him and said, let me kill the Jews, he said, please take them. Now, every midrash, Every uh, uh, mushal, parable of the sages has to have a reason. What does this story add to our understanding of Ahasuerus and Haman? To say Ahasuerus was happy to get rid of the Jews. What do you have, a dirt in your backyard, and the other guy has a hole, and you want to fill it? So the Rebbe said, there are two approaches of anti, two classic approaches of anti-Semitism. There are people that view the Jews as a mound. They are something that are bothersome, irritating, either they're unfair competition to them, uh, they're better at business, they're hogging the resources, whatever the perception is. You know, this happened in different places where different, um, uh, you know, economically or socially, or even in Egypt, it says that the Jews were found in Egypt. We say wherever the, the Egyptians went, to the movie theaters, not movies, but to the theater, to the 
is using Roman and Greek language. When they went to the to, 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 to entertainment, the Jews were there. In modern day, they go to the courthouse, the Jews are the lawyers. They go to the hospital, the Jews are the doctors. They go to their books, the Jews are the accountants, at least speaking. So in other words, the Jews are everywhere. They're an irritant. They, 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 they're bothering me by their existence. That's the Mao. But there's another type of anti-Semite. Anti-Semite has something lacking in his life. And he looks at the Jewish people who represent God on earth and have the Torah and the mitzvot, whether they're observing them all or not. He sees every Jew and he sees the whole in his own life. He sees, now he has a solution. The Rebbe said the Haman also has a solution. He can fill his life with value. He can find meaning in life. But for some people, they say, not I and not you, then I'll feel better. You know what? I'll get rid of you then I won't notice this vacuum. In other words, the idea that people are living with purpose, a comedian, a skeptic, a scoffer, will try to rip down sincere people. Why? Because they're lacking something. But instead of finding meaning in their life, they're going to try to rip down your belief system. Why? Let me be. Why, why are you trying? Because it's easier for many people to tear down that which is sacred and has values, and has morality, and has holiness, and has godliness, rather than developing in their own. There are anti-Semites like that. We found them in history. Even they are redeemable. A quick story um, of uh, the fifth Lubavitcher Rebbe when he was, when, when his, when his um, children, when, when he was young, he and his brother were um, playing outside. And he was younger than his older brother, but he was taller. So his, uh, his older brother pushed him down and said, look, now I'm taller. He pushed him down. So when he came inside, his father, the Rebbe, the fourth Rebbe, said to the older brother, come stand on the chair next to your little brother. He says, now look, you're taller. You don't have to push someone else down to be taller. You can lift yourself up. You know, Cain, what is what is the God tell Cain, sin crouches by the door. And if you will recognize it, you can overpower it. But you have to be willing to recognize your unique challenges and fight it. And Cain is not willing, and he kills his brother. This is before he kills his brother. This is early on. God tells him, remember, sin crouches by the door. Got to be ready for it. So in other words, there is this element we have among people that just like the scoffer, the cynic, wants to tear down everything, nihilism, Nothing matters. Nothing exists. Why? Because by seeing people who are sincere, who have a mission, it hurts them. It bothers them. There's a hole. So there's two types of anti-Semites. The people that the Jews bother and the people that have a hole inside of themselves. The ones that hole inside themselves, it's a deeper problem, but it's also one that is also able to be dealt with. The mountain one is usually less of an issue. In other words, it's not always, I don't, I don't want to say that, but there are different ways where you can pay off the person with the mountain, where it pays for them. In other words, for 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 the for the people who are um, feel that the the Jews are somehow taking away from them. So in the olden days, the king got an extra tax. They they helped them out in some way. They were there. You did something. But either way, there are two types of anti-Semites: those who the Jews bother by their uh, existence. Um, encroaching in their thought on their life. And then there are others who have their own issues and their own issues. And those type of issues are much more difficult to deal with because he has to deal with his own issues. Okay. So let's take a little bit further. Um, like we see with Haman again in the book of Esther, Haman gets angry after having the party with Esther because when he leaves, he sees Mordecai is not bound. And he says, everything in my life is worthless because Mordecai does not bow. My children, I have 10 lovely boys. Okay, he called them lovely. 10 murderous thugs as my kids in, in their father's image, plus a daughter, plus wealth, plus honor. I'm second to the king. And the queen invites me to a party. All this is dust and ashes because Mordecai the Jew will not bow down. In other words, there's something there. The Jew's not really bothering. It's all this is nothing to me. I have nothing. Why? I, because he has purpose. I don't have purpose. 
There's an element there. So for the Jew, there has to be a recognition of what the core is as well from a spiritual point of view. Here's a letter from the Rebbe to, um, to uh, what do you call it again? On Purim, regarding Purim. So he says here, even though there were Jews that looked like everyone else, Haman recognized the essential qualities and characteristics of the Jews, that with, which made all of them, with or without their consent, into one people. There are people that said, I'm not part of the Jewish people. Doesn't, you're one people. Namely, the laws are different from those of any other people. What do I mean? I, I, I'm, I'm totally acculturated. Yeah, I know who you are. You're a Jew. You can't hide. Hence, in his wicked desire, he seems to destroy everyone, men, women, and children. Although there were those days, too, Jews who kept all Torah mitzvot, but there were others who sought to assimilate themselves, yet could not escape the classification of belonging to that one people. And everyone was included in Haman's cruel decree. We know that from different stories of what was going on in the period before and after. First of all, many, whatever. The point is, there's many stories where you see that not all the Jews initially were on board with being a Jew in the full sense of the word. They didn't. They didn't convert out, but they were, you know, part of the Shushan, the party scene. They were there. So he says, in all ages, the Rebbe says there were Hamans, yet we have outlived them all, thank God. What is the secret of our survival? Here's the paradox. It says, the answer will be evident for the following illustration. When a scientist seeks to ascertain the laws governing a certain phenomenon or to discover the essential properties of a certain element in nature, he must undertake a series of experiments of the most varied conditions in order to discover those properties of laws which pertain under all conditions alike. No true scientific law can be deduced from a minimum number of experiments or from experiments under similar or only slightly varied conditions. For results as to what is essential and what is secondary are quite unimportant, would that not be conclusive? The same principle should be applied to our people. It's from the oldest in the world, beginning its national history, from the relation of Mount Sinai, 3,330 odd years ago. In the course, I added 30 years. In the course of these long centuries, our people lived under extremely varied conditions in most different times and places all over the world. The Jews are not in a Petri dish. The world is our Petri dish. We've been around. We've been everywhere, every type of circumstance. If we wish to discover the essential elements making up the cause and very basis of the existence of our people and its unique strength, you must conclude that it's not its peculiar physical or intrinsic mental characteristics, nor its tongue, manners, and customs, nor even its racial purity. For there are times in early history of our people, as well as during the Middle Ages, even recent times, whole ethnic groups and tribes have become proselytes and part of our people. It's not about race. It's not about our culinary skills. It's not about our intellect. I hate to break it to you. The Asians are pulling ahead in Harvard and Yale, and not just because of anti-Semitism. They tried to keep them out too. Just because there's a book called The Jewish Mystique where a German thinker tried to explain how Jewish IQ points were a bit higher. And he decided that the reason was because in the Middle Ages, what happened to the best and brightest in the Christian they world? Priests. They became priests. Yeah. So therefore, they weren't having children or officially, illegally. And if they were, it wasn't with the best of the people. But the point is, the Jews, the smartest and wisest, were having the largest families with the wealthy, smart, and wise other Jews. Everyone was, was so to speak, uh, growing. This was a, a German writer called The Jewish Mystique. That was a book before The Feminine Mystique. But it was, uh, that's the name of the book. But and it did come before. But the point of it is, all that, it doesn't explain you know, the Jewish, the Jewish uniqueness. When someone says, oh, we're smarter, I say you're a racist. If you say you're the chosen people because God gave you a mission, then you're a religion that God has made, a people that God has chosen. It's different than you trying to find what makes us better because you're looking at uh, physical characteristics. You know what? We've had all types. If everyone lost 40 IQ points, we'll still be the chosen people, Okay. This doesn't just mean you have 40 IQ points to spare. You know, even if you didn't have 40 IQ points to spare, okay? The point is, it doesn't take away from our mission in life. It's not about intellect. It's not about where we've lived evil, even. He says we've lived, we've been a scattered and dispersed people. It wasn't even the land of Israel. It makes it one people through its dispersion regardless of time is a Torah and mitzvot. That's the one unique quality that's always existed, which has it remained basically the same throughout the days, ages, and all places. It's the Torah and mitzvot which made our people indestructible on the world scene in the face of massacres and pogroms 
aiming at our physical destruction. And in the face of ideological insults of foreign cultures, aiming at our spiritual destruction. We've had both. We had Laban the Aramean, and we had Pharaoh at the beginning of our time. Laban wants to adopt the Jewish people and raise them among the, Amori the, the, the Amorites. Amori. Purim teaches us the age-old lesson, which has been verified even most recently, our sorrow. That no matter, he's talking about German Jews, French Jews, Austrian Jews. No matter, and also, of course, other Jews died too. Don't get it wrong. In other words, this, is, this doesn't take away. The point is that doesn't save us. In other words, assimilation doesn't save us. No matter of assimilation, not even which is extended over several generations, providing escape from Haman and the Hitlers. Nor can any Jew sever his ties with his people by attempting such an escape. So we're talking now about the survival of the Jewish people as a whole. But those who have assimilated also didn't escape their destiny. On the contrary, our salvation and existence depend precisely upon the fact that the same shown us Mikolam, their laws are different from any other people. Perm reminds us the strength of our people as a whole of each individual Jew lies in a closer adherence to our ancient spiritual heritage, which contains a secret of harmonious life, hence of a healthy and happy life. All other things, our spiritual and temporal life must be freed from any contradiction to the basis of existence, essence of our existence, and must be attuned accordingly in order to make for the utmost harmony and add to our physical and spiritual strength. Back to Jonathan Sachs, number 16. He says here, you're, this is following up the same theme. It's from the same essay. Really, it's from a book as well, um, called Future Tense. European Jews in the 19th and 20th century made one of the most tragic mistakes in history. They said, Jews cause anti-Semitism, and therefore they can cure it. Ah, it's me. It's me. They did everything possible. They said, people hate us because we're different. We'll stop being different. They gave up item after item of Judaism. They integrated. They assimilated. married out. They hid their identity. They failed to diminish anti-Semitism by one iota. All it did was debilitate and demoralize Jews. The most important thing Jews can do to fight anti-Semitism is never, ever to internalize it. That is what is wrong in making the history of persecution the basis of Jewish identity. This is a big problem where uh, has been, and now it may even be part of a solution, but still a problem. If your identity is people are trying to kill me, therefore I am, because you hate me, I am. So Sark, Sarka, right, said the an anti-Semitic Jew, he believed all these identities, all identities come from external forces. So therefore, you see yourself as a Jew because it's an anti-Semite. Stop seeing yourself as a Jew that we don't want anti-Semites. So the, 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 the point is, get rid of, in other words, you're, you're defined by the other's hatred. There's a famous line, if I am I, is a Kutzka Rebbe who used to say riddles like this. If I am I, because I'm not you, and you are you because you're not me, then I'm not I and you're not you. If I define myself just solely based on somebody else, that I'm different because I'm not them, or even worse, now, they want to kill me. You know, the famous joke, what is what is every Jewish holiday? They tried to kill us, we survived, let's eat. If you define your identity by someone trying to hurt you and kill you, that's not a positive identity. It's reactive. It's reactive. And it's not something that you're going to transmit to your grandchildren. Let me tell you, it doesn't transmit well. It doesn't transmit well to the society. Yes. Absolutely. The pillars of Jewish identity, Holocaust, is a challenge. The ADL, which does good work, the question is, how successful have we been with all our work, all our allies in eradicating anti-Semitism? All of a sudden, it popped up like untouched, unvarnished, an ancient evil from the depths of the ground from the Middle Ages that we thought we got rid of. We've been doing so much good work. Where is that? What happened? Now, I don't want to minimize totally our efforts. That's what we're going to get to. There are things that we can do working with other people and not crossing people out. But when you make that your whole identity going back, really all you are is either telling the younger generation and the next generation, I have one thing to offer you is blood and sacrifice and no victory, just survival. Survival is not very appealing. And again, in our first classes, we learned how, you know, secular Zionism thought it would get rid of anti-Semitism by normalizing the Jewish people. So that the, the assimilation of the 19th century was how can the individual Jew assimilate into the nation they were in, Germany or France? For early secular Zionism, it was how can the Jewish people assimilate into the family of nations? 
How can we be like everybody else? And that would get rid of anti-Semitism. That didn't work either. Totally. That's clear. On the other hand, of course, it's a miracle that we have the state of Israel and we could defend ourselves, which in other times we would have to flee if this was going on. We would have to bend and break and convert to Islam, God forbid, or whatever else we'd be forced to do if we didn't have the ability to defend ourselves, if they were coming through the gates like they did in the past. And not just the Muslims and, you know, the Crusaders. I'm not just picking on one, any one religion. It just happened to be right now, the present here and now issue that we're facing. The point is, thank God we have the state of Israel and all that. Nevertheless, the identity of um, me being based on others trying to kill me, for example, or anti-Semitism, is not a healthy identity. That's why, in general, if you scour the Rebbe's works about anti-Semitism, there's a handful of times, I mean, he spoke about the Holocaust, he spoke about other things, but really it was about the joy of being Jewish, the value of being Jewish, the positive elements. And even here, if you take a look at these type of teachings, it is, don't be intimidated, don't be pulled away by this, and don't limit yourself and define yourself by another's hatred. Very, very important. Now, in Hebrew, the word chazer is a, a pig, but it also means to return, chazir. So there are four non-kosher animals mentioned in the Torah, and it says each one represented one of the kingdoms that 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 uh, ruled the Jews. The last one is the chazir, which represents um, the the last exile, the last exile that we're in. Um, traditionally, Edom, which was seen as the uh, Rome, and then later on the Christian Church. And then we say that the word that the chazir, the wild boar of the Romans, that was a symbol, which the Torah alludes to as a prophecy, will return to the Jewish people, which means at the end of time, they'll come as we get closer, Christian anti-Semitism will diminish. And in many ways it has. The religious churches, their anti-Semitism, whether it was the Protestants and the Catholics, in their own way, got rid of elements of anti-Semitism that have not been the same when they're trying to give us the cross or the sword. It is not the same anymore. There has been changes. But, and, and, never, and, and none of these things are engraved in stone. We had golden ages under Muslims and we had golden ages under the Christians. It's not like it has to be. But there will be a time in the future, here's the line from Isaiah, Maimonides writes it, the wolf will dwell with the lamb, the leper will lie down with the young goat, these words are a metaphor and a parable. The interpretation of the prophecy is as follows. Israel dwells securely together with the wicked Gentiles. We don't call them anti-Semites in the ancient times. We call them wicked. They tried to kill us. They were like it to wolf and a leopard. And the prophecy of Jeremiah. They will all return to the true faith and no longer steal or destroy. That is our belief. At the end of time, all of humanity will get along with each other. We believe that. And even in this world, we have that ability to help that along. Um, and not to um, and not to write people off. Here's a line from the Midrash. Um, the Midrash says to Hadrian, a, 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 a fellow, a thinker, wrote to Hadrian, the Roman emperor. You know, you're not consistent in your anti-Semitism. It's not true. You you claim you hate the Jews because you hate circumcision. So the Arabian also circumcised. If it's Sabbath, the Kuthans do. Clearly, you simply hate the Jewish people. You're just finding excuses. So what does Sharansky say? He says he has a 3D test of anti-Semitism. Demonization, double standards, and delegitimization. So this is a simple test. First D is demonization. If the Jewish state is being demonized, when it's blown out of all sense of proportion, this is, this is what was years ago, when comparisons are made between Israelis and Nazi and Palestinian refugee camps in Auschwitz, that's anti-Semitism. It's demonization. It's not in any sense, any, 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 uh, any, 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 anything close to reality. The second D is double standards. When criticism of Israel is applied selectively, you know, um, for example, collective punishment. You look through all the New York Times articles about um, out of like 600 mentions over the last 50 years of of collective punishment, out of 600, like 530 were applied to Israel. And they, there are themes and there are tropes that they use, that they're picking on. Why? It's part of a, whatever the reason, it's the hole or the mountain. I don't care. To me, it doesn't matter. See, the mountain or the hole. Personally, I think for many, it's the hole. For many of those people, the, the, the more the atheist, agnostic, uh, um, valueless 
ultimately when you dig down where, where there's an element of emptiness that they look back at the past or others, there's an element of their self-justification. And, and hey, that's, that's my reading. I can't say what's in anyone's heart, but hey, I just did. All right. The second D is double standards. So he says, if you have China, Iran, Cuba, and Syria running the human rights uh, watch, and while Muggen David Adom alone among the world ambulance services denied admission, that's anti-Semitism. Hey, come on. The third D is delegitimization. When Israel's fundamental right to exist is denied, Alone among all the people that's who is anti No one else has it. You have all these, you have all these entities that also came from other places that don't have our history, and they're all allowed to exist in the 192 nations in the United Nations. Only the Jews have no right of existence. And not just that, if you follow what's going on, they keep changing the rules. When we talk about double standards, they change the rules of what it means occupation. As soon as Israel left Gaza, all of a sudden it became you're still occupying them because you're you're blocking that border. You know, blocking a sea, a sea blockade is an act of war. It's not an occupation. Egypt is blocking them too. So all of a sudden it's Israel. Why? Because a deliberate desire to see through a certain lens. It fits into their narrative that they want for whatever reason. I don't have to psychoanalyze them. Like the Rebbe said, it's their problem. It's not your problem. You have to defend yourself. And you can work with them as we're going to see in a minute. But to change who and what they are inside they have to do it's their work that has to get done. Okay, so here's the Rebbe. What happened was, oh, two, two ideas. This we did already once, but I'll, we did we did it in the past. But he says, Rebbe says, why do I invoke the biblical land of Israel, the Holy Land? This is an early letter. And like, uh, he says, in the covenant with Abraham, why not make God in the picture? Those who fought for the creation of the state, those who led it and currently directed and authorized representative, they all proclaim and take pains to emphasize that Israel is a state founded in 1948. My answer, put frankly, is that their narrative is false. No new entity was created in 1948. Rather, that was the year in which a large part of the land of Israel was liberated. An entity established in 1948 based on the agreement or authorization of the nations of the world has no strength or justification in terms of an authentic response to the claim your thieves are having conquered land and belong to others. Claim raised by the Arabs, the Vatican, the United Nations, some Jews as well. It's our God-given homeland. And again, it doesn't mean it's not true that every other nation also conquered others. But the fact is, this is one answer to all their all their questions. If we internalize it, Rebbe says, I don't delude myself into thinking that these just and honest arguments prevail in the United Nations, the Vatican, etc. Nevertheless, transmitting this truth is critical for the morale of Jewish youth living in the Holy Land, including those serving the IDF, for Jewish American students, and for the Jewish youth of other countries. Rebbe's talking about the youth. He saw what was coming. All the people intuitively knew Israel's protection against the Holocaust. They didn't need, all of a sudden, wait, wait, what right? This is who we are. This is ours from the beginning of time. We have to change our education policy. Not 1948 established the state of Israel, the UN, the Balfour Declaration, the Peel, this, that, Ottoman, World War I, World War II. That's not what it is. It's our land. A separate question. When do you have to retreat? When do you have to uh, uh, protect yourself. These are separate questions of who they belong to. And the line the Rebbe used to say, in Noah Hyde laws, if someone steals something that doesn't belong to them, it's bad for them. It's bad for the Arabs spiritually and materially from God's point of view for them to take the land of Israel that doesn't belong to them. For them to hold on to stolen land is bad for them. It is not good. The Holy Land, the land of Israel, was named after a named guy called Israel. Jacob, that was his name. We're not named after the land. The land is named after us. This is who we are. This is what we are. The land is ours. Okay. So the Rebbe's point, though, is, is that uh, we have to change our education, both of ourselves and to our people, leaving aside the, the voice in the wilderness, talking to the nations. We could say it there, and you can say it with confidence. And there will be, to some degree, the same way they let the Muslims preach their religion, everyone takes it and listens to what they have to say, if we said things in an absolute sense, it also could have an impact, at least on religious people, those who believe in the Bible, who know it's there, and in the Quran, because it's there too. The land of Israel belongs to the Jews. Okay, but now there's another point. The Rebbe, this is what we just said about, but it's not, here's the problem. On one hand, we just said the land of Israel was not what determined our identity. For 2,000 years, we didn't have the land of Israel. We had Torah and Mitzvot. So why do we need a land already? This is a criticism. You're religion. What do you need a state for? 
You know, is the what what was the you know how many what what defines a religion? Is it nationalism? What do you need a state for anyway? Why did God give a land? Forget about today. Why did God make such a big deal in the Torah about Jews having a land? So I'm skipping down to reading number 22. The relationship between the Jewish people and the land of Israel is unique. It's not comparable to the relationship between any other nation in its homeland. Rather, Jewish land is an integral part of the Jewish people's spiritual mission. Part of our religion is to have this little land of Israel. The ultimate goal of Jewish people's divine service is to turn this tangible world into a world for godly revelation to the point that God's holiness dwells specifically in the physical reality of this world. Oh, religion has to stay pure. There's, render unto Caesar that which is Caesar's or render unto uh, God what is God. That's not the Jewish approach. It's all meant to be served for God. Give me a Jewish garbage man and I will show you the Messiah. Give me a Jewish... A uh, street cleaner, and you're going to show me what, what, what life is about. Now, it doesn't mean it's the only way to live Torah mitzvot. You can live Torah mitzvot outside the land of Israel, too. But the idea that is linked to a physical land and to ultimately how we lead our lives in the real world in the most ideal manner is without question part and parcel of the Jewish identity. The ultimate goal, we just said, okay, for this reason, the majority of the Torah's commandments involve physical activities. So the fulfillment of Torah Mitzvah instills sanctity into tangible materials. It was therefore crucial to provide the Jews of the land of Israel, physical land, and provide them with abundance of Mitzvah that can be formed exclusively with the land. For this expressed the entire goal of the Jewish people, the purpose of the Torah, to conquer the physical dimension of the world and transform it into a home for God. This doesn't mean that now, this is only Pinchas that brought this up uh, Sunday, this doesn't mean that from a uh, traditional point of view, the only place to serve God is the land of Israel. Until the Mashiach comes, we have mission in serving God wherever we may be. But we are not embarrassed and we're not apologetic that we're a, a, a religion that values materialism as a mode of revealing the divine in the material. Not materialism as it having its own independent value, but rather it being the donkey upon which the Messiah rides. In other words, the Messiah rides on a donkey. In Hebrew, the word chamor is the same word as materialism, humorous, that we recognize that's engagement with the physical world. We don't go sit in a mountaintop and not in the ivory tower, not just because they don't let us in the ivory tower anymore, but because our job is to come down from the ivory tower and be in the real world. And this land of Israel and leading a Jewish life there is part and parcel of that existence. It's not foreign to it. So this idea, there is a, a concept that um, and this is our close with. Give me five more minutes. Sorry about that. This is a good piece, the last one. Um, there is a quote that says, it's a law. Esau hates Jacob. It's a natural, immutable law like physics. There will be Gentiles that hate the Jews. It is. Why? It is. Why is gravity? Gravity is. Don't ask why. It is. We find this. And if you look at all times and places, there's always been someone that hated the Jews. Okay, so does that mean it's unavoidable? Wait. If gravity is a law, does that mean I can't make an airplane to fly? Does it mean I can't jump? No, no, no. Just because there's a law doesn't mean we can't deal with it. So what happens? Jacob meets Esau. And when Jacob meets Esau, um, he prepares with prayer. He prepares with giving gifts. And he prepares for war. So whenever Jews went to the Romans or to the Greeks or to the, or to the Germans early on, the, the different kings and rulers, the leadership would study the portion of Jacob. They would open up the Torah and say, God, please give me the wisdom to know when to put pressure, when to bribe, when to pray, and when to do all three, and when and where and how much to push and how much to pull. And they would read that story because there's a recognition that these things are needed at times. So I'm going to skip down to this last reading. I believe it's the last. Okay, two two readings, two last ones. One was the Gaul successor. Um, decided that instead of selling the 50 Mirage uh, aircraft to Israel, he's going to give it to Libya. And Libya was then going to send it to Egypt. So this was, de Gaulle had decided in 67 after the war, anyone who fought, there was going to be an arms embargo. France was going to be Israel's great ally till then. And then de Gaulle decided anyone who fought in the war, they're not helping. But really just meant Israel wasn't getting help. 
and he was going to send. They were going to send now to Libya, and Libya was then going to give it to Egypt, you know, because he had all these other Arab nations. So when they came to New York, there were protests, and he was they, he was jostled in Chicago, I think, and he felt that the police in Chicago were not there. The Jews were upset with him. The 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 Federation, all those people came out, and the Rebbe was not a fan. The Rebbe said. Even though there was a fishing embargo, as he spoke at a talk, he says France was selling weapons to Israel, small arms. Now, after the protest, he canceled small arms as well. After some time, when the protest quieted down, Israel once again began dealing with him, and he began, he was able to extract 300 Jews from Egypt. No protest, no publicity, no news. The Israeli government asked the newspapers not to write about it in order to protect uh, Papadou from pressure by foreign governments and his French constituents. We know this from non Jewish newspapers. No, he says here, the only way to deal with anti-Semitism is not by coming to him every day and morning and shouting, listen, you're an anti-Semite. I'll be honest with you. The way that people are demanding in, in, in Harvard how the Chabad rabbi there, people are complaining that he's not uh, attacking the head of Harvard. It's not your role. If you want to make change, it's not always your role to go on and point out, you're an anti-Semite, you're an anti-Semite. Why? What does Rebbe say? He says here, rather speak, there are a lot of anti-Semites. If we're going to go around outing all anti-Semites today, you're going to out out uh, 4 billion people. This is, lo zu aderech. This is not the way. The Rebbe says why. Because the person has a vision of himself that he's a good person. Most people do. Rebbe says, rather speak to him in a diplomatic way. He knows well what you think of him, but he's a human being. And behaves like a human being. And why is he treated like a human being? He says, once was treated this way, they were able to do it. So here's the last letter. What happened was Jesse Helms was the first two uh, terms. He was very antagonistic. In 73, he proposed a resolution. Israel returned the West Bank to Jordan. In 1982, he demanded Israel sever diplomatic relations with Israel. He was the enemy of the Jews in, the, in Congress. In the Senate. A year or so later, General, Senator Helms took part in a friend to Lubavitch event in Washington. And Alan Dershowitz was furious. And he wrote the Rebbe a letter. And he said, what are you doing? Jesse Helms is not a friend. And then he wrote him a long letter about, um, in general, about different values that Lubavitch would like to see in the world. Education, God. They're not necessarily just related to how an individual sees the Jews and has anti-Semitic thoughts or not. The Rebbe wasn't saying, and you see it in the letter, he wasn't saying Jesse Helms was an anti-Semite just because he was anti-Israel, which is important. It can be. Although today, again, Israel's taken the place for many people and is emerging. Listen to this line here with Jesse Helms. In a PS, in general, whenever the Rebbe would respond to something, the PSs were always good because... That's where the Rebbe said, don't get upset, but I want to cut to the point. So he said, Rebbe say, I wish to refer to your characterization of the person as described in your letter. I trust you will agree that in regard to persons of influence, whether in Washington or elsewhere, the first objective should be to persuade and encourage such a person to use his influence in a positive way on behalf of any and all good causes which are important to us. We should welcome every public appearance which lends public support to the cause, especially when there's a likelihood that maybe the forerunner of similar, similar pronouncements in the future. A case in point is the public stance of the very person who is the subject of your letter on a matter which is surely close to your heart. I believe it's not of the first of its kind, nor I hope the last. My experience with such people, who I've per never personally met the said person, has convinced me that politicians are generally motivated more by expediency than by conviction. If this is, if this is praise, watch out. No, but the point is, this is the reality of what a politician is. They want to be elected. <laughs> they have interests. In other words, your public pronouncements of various issues do not stem from categorical principle or religious imperatives from a politician. Hence, most of them, if not all, Rebbe doesn't want, to, doesn't want to go on a limb here, but he's willing to say, if not all, are subject to change in their positions, depending on time, place, and other factors. That's the way it is. In the olden days, it might have been bribery. But nowadays, it's not bribery. It could be all sorts of things that can help a person, just like in the old days, it wasn't just bribery. You know, when you're uh, weak. But there are votes. There's policies. There's working together. You scratch my back, I scratch yours. I believe that the proper approach to such person by Jewish leaders should not be rigid. As a rule, it does no good to engage in a cold war, which may often turn to a hot war, nor does it serve any useful purpose to brand one as an enemy or an anti-Semite. 
like uh, whatever. I, I don't want to talk about what's happening right now, what they did to certain college um, leaders. Who the reality is, they may have been um, um, prisoners of their own worldview. They're not anti-Semites, not necessarily. I don't know what's in their heart, but they were sure they didn't have to stay locked in whatever position that was. These are not Hamasniks. These are not people sworn to the destruction of the Jewish people. I'm not saying such people don't exist, but not everyone who dislikes you is it's that for, for human rights. They're for human rights, and they may, they may, but they may, and they may even dislike you. No, it's possible they don't like the nasal sound of the Jewish voice or my high pitched whatever I'm doing right now. Whatever it is they don't like, there may be reasons. So what? It's not the end of the world. They can work with you. They can change. Rebbe says. However tempting to do so, even that person vehemently denies it, it could only be counterproductive. On the contrary, ways and means should be found to persuade such a person to take a favorable stance, at least publicly. We haven't too many friends, and attaching labels will not gain us any. Instances abound. The approach advocated above produced good results. To cite one well-known case, the leader of the moral majority at times made highly unfavorable pronouncements, especially the one about missionary activities a few weeks ago. Yet the government of Eretz Yisrael made special efforts to gain support, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. There's surely no need to point out to you the responsible Jewish leaders cult consistently cultivated good public relations, indeed even cores relations with President Carter and his predecessors. Going back to FDR, FDR didn't bomb the camps. He didn't let the Jews. He do things he didn't do, but you had to deal with it. You had to deal with it. Doesn't mean that you cut all ties because you're having a challenge. There are ways to apply pressure. You have to find, regardless of this, sometimes openly negative feelings to Jews and Jewish causes. And I'm not saying there aren't times for that. But the Rebbe said, the wisdom of set approach is born. This was a big debate with the Rebbe. The Rebbe was against Kahana on this and against the, the, the uh, public um, um, humiliation of the Soviets in America to force the Jews out. He believed quiet diplomacy, the Jackson Yavanek, the, the, the different approaches of pressure from the government quietly would accomplish a lot more. If you try to humiliate the great powers or whatever you want to call them, the, those who have the strong sense of self, not just individuals, you cause pushback. And the Rebbe said, I'm seeing this time and time again. When you do that, they were about to release certain Jews in the 70s, and you shut it down. And we said, wait. I even asked one of them, please wait a week until this group comes out before you do your protest. The guy didn't listen. The Rebbe said, you're playing with wives here, and it's not true that it's really helping. What really helped with the other stuff, the private diplomacy was making a bigger impact. Of course, there are ways to put pressure on your diplomats and your politicians as well. But the Rebbe said, he says here, there are those who claim that anti-Soviet demonstrations, similar actions will induce the Kremlin to change its policy. Others, myself included, are convinced that quiet diplomacy has been effective and certainly not counterproductive. I know there's nothing to be lost there. I urged and pleaded behind the scenes, of course, with such an approach with Jewish leaders. Unfortunately, my pleadings were unheeded. This is one of the reasons why I write to your correspondence as PS, which has nothing to do with the person about which you wrote. He didn't believe that Jesse Helms was the same case. In hope that you may use your influence with your friends who are active in Jewish concerns in directions indicated above. So in different times and periods, the main points the Rebbe would bring out, you have to realize Hashem protects us. We do have to engage in practical security. We should exert our influence through quiet diplomacy. Don't lose your backbone. Be proud as a Jew. It's not effective to confront everyone. I'm saying someone. By proving that he or she is an anti semite Ha! I got you! I got you! You know, that doesn't help. It doesn't usually help. When we change a narrative in the country, yes. Can we change what is considered acceptable and acceptable behavior in the public? Yes. And there are allies for that as well. But not everyone who disagrees with you is an enemy. They may have a different set of values that, you know what, may shift tomorrow too. A lot of things can happen. This doesn't mean you don't do what you can to protect yourself. You have to be you have to be going around and tagging everyone who hates Jews or dislikes Jews or doesn't love Jews as an anti-Semite. It's not productive. And people do change. We found that. Anyway, don't spend energy answering specific individual complaints against the Jews. Emphasize this. We didn't do the videos, but there uh, we're all in the image of God. The things are all human beings share. There are things after the Crown Heights riots. When we saw a modern day murder program of Jews in the nine, 1991 in Crown Heights, Brooklyn, led by Al Sharpton, and a, a, he was the same one that did Tawana Brawley and the Koreans, and he also did the Freddies. The point is, this guy is a professional rabble rouser, 
and a, a Jew got killed, a Polish taxi driver got shot, um, people were beaten, property burned, Dinkins said, let the, let, the, uh, let the rioters vent their, their rage, and it took a while till the federal government threatened to come in, but when Dinkins came and other people came, the Rebbe's approach always was to promote this idea that is one in the United States, we share, we're all citizens, all protected. The melting pot, the Rebbe said to Dinkins before the riots, he told him, should be so active that it won't be necessary to point out this one's a black man and this one is a, from China and this one's a Jew. In other words, the, the, the state's view should not be to, to differentiate. But the Rebbe's point always was when he would say that this idea of, uh, of, of recognizing the godly in each person and, and, and finding that and focusing on that and bringing it forth. This doesn't mean you sell out who you are and what you believe in. You stand strong for Israel. You stand strong, but you don't have to paint everybody who disagrees as an anti-Semite. You're allowed to have sympathy for the situation that people are in and what's happening in the world, what's happening to Palestinian kids. Of course, we should feel sad. Do we know where it's from? It's from Hamas. If Hamas was not doing it, this wouldn't be happening. We know that. We know that. So, But we still could say, of course, it's a terrible thing that people are dying. Anyone dying. The Rebbe would say about terrorists. Better they should repent. Hamas should repent. If they don't repent and they're still trying to kill you, we'll have to kill them first because they won't stop. But it's not that we necessarily uh, want the death of the wicked. No, if they stop being wicked, that's fine too. For sure, everybody else, let me stop this year and then open it up. But for sure, everyone else, we, we, we can't make, if everyone's a Nazi, nobody's a Nazi. You know, it's, it's horrific what we do. We do it, we, we, people do. We're busy painting every. It's not the same thing. South Africa's government is being uh, nasty to the Jews right now, and they're doing something which is foolish. They're doing something that's not true. It doesn't mean we have to burn down. If I live in South Africa, all my relations with the ruling party, the chief rabbi who's calling them out publicly, not necessarily. Um, does that mean that the only approach that can work? I don't know. I'm not sure what else can work. But there are other things that have worked in the past and that can work that somehow, uh, you know, things can change in some way, possibly, maybe not. But in other words, just full circle, not everyone is antagonistic to the Jewish state or even the existence of the Jewish state is irredeemable. Mm -hmm. And there are areas where you, they can mitigate and see our side of the coin. They can see what's happening and they won't be knee jerk. What do you put them in the enemy camp and they're all there? Look, I, by putting Musk in the enemy camp, that wasn't smart. Make him into the biggest anti-Semite. I'm not saying he's the biggest, loves all the Jews, you know, but I'm saying by making him into anti-Semite, now there's been a shift back. It's been helpful. Do we want him on the other side? No. Does it mean we agree with his family choices or his politics or his cars? Not necessarily. No, no, no one, no, don't, no one should take this as uh, be personally offended by that. But I'm just saying, in other words, uh, the, the point is there are all sorts of people in the world who can have different opinions that we can work with and move, but we should not give up on our identity and our views and our strength to stand up for Torah, for Judaism, to protect life, which is an imperative, the most important thing. And it's horrific and it's dirty and it's messy right now. And it's going to get messier. I mean, with God's help, it won't. But uh, realistically, um, there's going to, I, Iran's going to have to be stopped by somebody. The Houthis are going to have to be stopped by somebody. The, the Hezbollah is going to have to be stopped by somebody. With God's help, it won't be uh, the Jews living in Israel. The world is also suffering for it. So uh, this doesn't mean you give up, though, on your security just because you're worried what the nations of the world will say. Just because I'm polite and respect all the good that America has done, doesn't mean I go along with everything they tell me. Because I am, when I say I, the state of Israel, has an obligation to its inhabitants to protect it. And America will respect that. Right now, America is going to present what its interests are as well. And so will Saudi Arabia. Saudi Arabia has to talk to its street. Don't believe everything necessarily that Saudi Arabia is saying 
They're still saying they want to make peace with Israel in the future, but it has to be a Palestinian state. They're saying that for their people. They don't care about the Palestinians from first day one. The Saudi Arabians care about one thing only, the Saudi Arabians. And the question is going to be, for them, how can they avoid exciting their street and keeping control of parts of the Arab world by, you know, giving their viewpoint? That's my interpretation. I might be wrong, but either way, if I'm right or wrong, Israel does not have the right to endanger its people by not being able to protect them, which would be by going back to the status quo of uh, not being able to protect their borders. So um, God's help, Hashem owes Amo Yitain, God should give strength to his people. Hashem Yavarech, Hashem Yavarech, God should give peace.